As most of you guys know, I'm Father Justin Patterson, and I'm the, the rector of our parish. I'm glad. Elijah's here, one of our, one of our youth in the parish, and uh, a couple of you guys from Asbury, and uh, Nick, are you in high school or college now? I'm in college. You're in college now. You graduated. Yes. And uh, we have folks from Catholic backgrounds, Protestant backgrounds, some Orthodox. It's really I'm glad you guys are here today. So um, this is a, intended to be a, a real basic introduction to the Orthodox Christian faith um, in 11 parts. And I was thinking that that's so long, and I asked one of my best buddies who's a priest out in the West, I said, how long is your series? He said, oh, at 24. <laughs> so this should be a lot more manageable than that. And, uh, but the thing about our faith is that you never run out of things you can reflect on and teach on. And so this is just, let's be honest, this is just, uh, we're skimming things here. We're going through things very shallowly. Um, but hopefully we'll get a taste of the deep waters uh, periodically. And, and that should be hopefully a good thing. Michael, come on down. If you want. There's a chair right here if you want to sit. Um, so I, I just figured I'll, 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 I'll tell you a little bit myself. Not that this is about me, but you're, you're stuck with me. For the, you know, if you want to come back to class the next 10, seri- 10 nights. Um, I, am, uh, I became Orthodox in college. And uh, I first encountered the Orthodox Church through the World Book Encyclopedia. As a young lad, uh, when I was a boy, I would read the encyclopedias for fun, which is kind of weird. Uh, but I didn't know much about it, except that I went to Catholic school. My parents were Protestants, but I went to Catholic school, so I had that exposure. I learned about the Eastern Church, but I, I, never, I never attended. And then my, 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 my best buddy in college was from Syria, and I was shocked to learn he was a Christian. And he told me about this church he belonged to called the Orthodox Church. And I'm like, is it, is it Catholic? He said, no, it's, it's Orthodox. And, and I said, well, I want to go. And um, I, I began, uh, I visited once. I had a pretty bad experience, actually. I told some of you the story recently. I won't repeat it. But it was a bad story and a bad experience. I didn't go back for over a year. But by the time I was a senior, I'd been attending Orthodox liturgy for two years regularly. And I was baptized uh, in 1999. So... Um, Anyway, but I would say that one of the things I really relished about my time becoming Orthodox was all the friendships, both inside the Orthodox Church and friends among the Protestants and Catholics. We had really lively, lively conversations. When I hang out with you guys at Asbury, it feels a lot like what you guys have, you know, this really intense friendship and debates, and, but a real concern for truth, you know. And I remember asking God, God, help me land in a place where I can live my life and have stability, you know, spiritually, have spiritual stability. So I I think he answered my prayer. So um, I'm very grateful. Just part of my story, too, is uh, the church history meant a lot to me. As I learned about the Orthodox faith, what really impressed me the most was how it was the story of the church was was not 100 years old or 200 years old. It was it was 2000 years old. And that's what kind of hooked me and made me say, I've got to do this. I've got this is a living tradition. But I, I would say to you, what, that is enough to keep me orthodox. The, the history alone will not sustain your faith. Because history is history, and it's great. But ask me more than that. What keeps me here, I would say, are two things that we're going to talk about tonight. The first is, I need to experience God. I have to experience God. Or it's not, it's not real. <laughs> and then, two, I need the experience of a spiritual family. And by God's mercy... Despite my many sins and many failures, I feel like he keeps pouring out the experience of his life on me here. And also he gives me a spiritual family. I, I, you'll hear me allude to my, all my Orthodox friends I have all over the country. And we have this family. I have friends in Russia, a priests and laity, uh, men and women uh, who are like my family because I'm Orthodox. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So um, I'm going to keep going now. Uh, Turning to, I want before we get too deep into anything here. I want to go over the course syllabus. I'm going to grab. I'm going to grab yours, Ryan. Uh, they're right here in this pile. Uh, we'll be looking over the next um, ten weeks over these topics. Uh, the first few parts will be focusing on the spiritual foundations, and and then the next two classes on the Orthodox worldview. Very important. Part four will talk about sin, the passions, the and really the problem 
what is the problem that Christianity is trying to resolve? So that, what, what is the problem Christ is addressing? So it's answering that question. Part five, we'll be looking at Christ and the tradition that reveals him, which is the tradition of the church, the preaching of Christ, the kerygma. Part six through nine, we'll be exploring that tradition. And among the things that are part of our tradition would be uh, liturgy, uh, the church councils, the Holy Fathers, church art. All these things c- comprise the holy tradition uh, itself. And then the final two parts would be looking at how we confess Christ today and how we're conformed to, to his image. So if you, all the details are here, and we'll be unpacking this more each night as we go. On the back of this handout, by the way, are kind of general books about the Orthodox faith. If you want to find a good book to read, we have a lot of them in our parish library. And we have many of them also in our parish bookstore down in the parish hall. And if you, if you still can't find it, see me. I have a big library in here. I lose more books than I ever had. So I, I'll, I'll be happy to bar- let you borrow one. There's also online resources here uh, as well. So let's turn here to, to the theme for the night, which is encountering the mystery. Um, I'm using uh, tonight as my sort of inspiration uh, a wonderful book by ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew I called Encountering the Mystery. And it's sort of a catechetical introduction to the Christian Orthodox faith. But what I like about it is, 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 the, is, is how he frames it. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm not going to teach you a lot about Orthodoxy, but I'm going to give you the framework for talking about Orthodoxy. And I'm just stealing from him. So it's plagiarism, but I'm telling you that. So uh, He's interesting. He is the first among equals of the Orthodox bishops. Some would say he's like our Pope, but we wouldn't say that. Uh, but he is, he is our first ranking bishop. If there's a conflict in orthodoxy, we appeal to him. And he has the job of chairing all the councils of the church and that sort of thing. Uh, he was, he's a, uh, born a Greek in Turkey. His name, is, uh, his name was Demetrios uh, Arakontonis. And uh, he became ecumenical patriarch in 1991. He lives in Istanbul, but he'll tell you it's Kostanopol. And, uh, you know, he's the second sea of Christianity for the first 1,000 years. And then um, after Rome fell away from the, from the ancient faith, we believe, um, uh, the, the ecumenical patriarch assumed the mantle of leading the churches um, as first among equals. So this is his, his work I'm sharing with you tonight. <clears throat> Saint Nikolai Velimirovich, this man depicted here in slide five, um, a fantastic American saint. He was of Serbian birth. Served in Serbia, knew English very well, represented the Serbian church abroad in England and America, spent time in Dachau. He was arrested by the Nazis and lived in Dachau for a couple of years, almost died there, never really recovered from that, the wounds. But he has this great quote, Our religion is founded on spiritual experience, seen and heard as surely as any physical fact in this world, not theory, not philosophy, not human emotions, but experience. This is an important kind of starting point for us. While the very word orthodoxy might seem to signify kind of a dogmatic or liturgical rigidity, right? You think orthodox, it sounds very strict, like orthodox Jews, maybe. Um, the, the real meaning of the word orthodoxia in Greek is literally right glory, to give thanks to God, to give praise to God in a correct manner. And that's, that's a definition we really like. Uh, But the patriarch reminds us again and again that orthodoxy insists upon the equal importance not only of creed, but of this like glorying experience, the experience of God in worship, in prayer, in our daily life. So the two have to balance out. Otherwise, we end up with with the charge of Jesus and the Pharisees, your whitewashed sepulchers, woe to you, dot, dot, dot. So we want to avoid that, right? The patriarch uh, Bartholomew continues. He says this, Orthodox Christianity is a way of life in which there is profound and direct relationship between praxis, that's practice, and dogma, faith and life. The unity of faith and life means that the reality of the eternal truth lies in the the power of experience rather than in the codification into ideological constructs. So it's about our experience, not about our ideology. He says this, Truth is beheld, not understood intellectually. God is seen, not examined theoretically. Beauty is perceived, not speculated about abstractly. It's like when, you love, when you're in love with somebody, the best way to know their love, theoretically, might be to dissect the person. 
You know, you can see how the heart works. You can learn about them, but you wouldn't learn about love, right? You wouldn't learn about what really makes them tick. You have to love them in order to experience who they really are. And by parsing it, you don't accomplish anything necessarily. So we are concerned with parsing. We, we have a real theological tradition in orthodoxy. However, the, the alpha and the omega for us is the experience of the living God. You know, so we, I, I always try to remind myself of that when I'm doing reading and theology or preparing for a sermon. You know, it isn't about the Greek, though the Greek is important. It isn't about, you know, the, the councils, though the council is important. It's about how does what I'm looking at connect me to the experience of the living God. This is, this is it. Um, Patriarch Bartholomew suggests um, this. Each human person is uniquely created in the image of God, never able to be reduced to anything less than than a mystery. And so, for us, God reveals Himself, and we experience Him, but part of the beauty of how He reveals Himself is He reveals us in a personal manner. He reveals Himself to us in, in person. Literally, in the person of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about this a lot more in the next couple of weeks. But God reveals Himself to us. He breaks through into time, into our world, not just to give us a set of rules or laws, but to give us the very life and to relate to us as persons. So the entire approach the patriarch is offering us today is a look at personhood. And with that, I'm going to pause and invite others to come in the room. Okay, continuing here. So the first thing we're going to look at is person as, as mystery. This is slide six. St. Macarius, one of the great desert fathers of Egypt in the fourth century, said this. This is a great quote. This is a little snippet of it. I'm reading the whole thing for you. Within the heart, there are unfathomable depths. There are reception rooms and bedchambers within it, doors and porches, and many offices and passages. In it, the heart, is the workshop of righteousness. In it is the workshop of wickedness. In it is death. In it is life. The heart itself might be only a small vessel. Yet dragons lurk there. There are lions. There are poisonous beasts and all the treasures of evil. There are rough and uneven roads. There are precipices. There are, but there too is God and all the angels. Life is there. The kingdom is there. There too is light. There are the apostles, the heavenly cities, the treasures of grace. All things lie within the little space that is the heart. So um, the question is, why is each person so? Why is the heart so capacious? And, you know, the answer for Christians would be, of course, what's revealed to us in, in Genesis, that God has made us, he's made us all in his image. And we're the only beings capable of that kind of depth that belongs to God himself. And this is a very powerful thought. Um, an image, if it is really a likeness, a true likeness, as St. Gregory of Nyssa will say, needs to faithfully copy the features of the original image. Since God, as the pattern for us, is beyond our ability to perceive and comprehend, so then, in a different but real way, each person, each of you, each of us, is beyond our ability to fully perceive and comprehend. That's why we, we drive each other crazy so much. Because we're each unfathomable. And the, the, our capacity for good and evil, and everything in between... For, for depth and profundity to shallowness, it's all there. You know, because, not that God can be shallow, but, but all the things, that, the range of the Godhead we have, because we're the only, only ones made in His image. Uh, this is an incredible, by the way, this is uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This is slide seven. Uh, Father Alexander Schmemann, one of the great kind of heroes of the Orthodox Church in America, and his wife, uh, Juliana, who would, who would chide my wife when she was pregnant with John Patrick at the <laughs> seminary. Uh, Solzhenitsyn wrote this. A great, a great writer. He wrote this in the Gulag Archipelago in 1973. He survived the death camps. He writes this. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. If only that were the case but rather the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? The line runs right through here. It's this incredible mystery 
the person, uh, our capacity for good and evil is, is huge. And so um, we say this, not, we're not giving all the answers here. We're just, this is the framework of orthodoxy, right? The person is this unfathomable mystery. And it doesn't matter whether you're baptized or you're a Satanist or you're, you're any faith or, or no faith. We're, we all share this as human beings. And, and we celebrate this as a sort of part of our framework of, of the Christian teaching. We also celebrate the person, isn't that cute, slide number eight. Uh, this is Patrick Bartholomew once again. We celebrate the person as truly free. Free will and the freedom of the person is a fundamental teaching of our church. Uh, Patrick Bartholomew says, the notion of freedom is absolutely critical to orthodox faith and life. Um, he tells a story in his book of a Hasidic rabbi who asked the question, what is the worst thing that evil can urge us to achieve? And the answer, he says, is to make us forget that we're each a child of the king, to forget that we each have a royal lineage, a heritage, to forget that each of us is born to be free, to exercise free will. Without spiritual freedom, the Orthodox Church teaches, authentic personhood cannot be fully realized. The patriarch continues, the human being as an existential reality, can be a person only when living in total freedom, only in conditions in which the dull range of possibilities is open to our free and conscious choice, are we able to transform our temporal reality and ourselves into the image of the kingdom of God. This is really important. So then, is freedom doing whatever I want? See, this is what our culture says. Freedom is doing whatever the heck floats my boat. I'm a libertarian, right? I can, as long as I don't hurt you, I'm fine. I can do whatever I want. This is this is what this is current orthodoxy in the world, right? Um, the answer, of course, is no. <laughs> right? You can't. You, this is not what freedom is. Real freedom, the patriarch says, requires an incredible amount of work and effort. He calls developing freedom our unceasing task, a gift that is acquired through spiritual effort. It requires dynamic ascetical discipline. Indeed, the main purposes of our ascetic disciplines in the church is to assist us in recovering this God-given freedom that we have squandered. To be free is not simply to do what we please, for the only veritable freedom, the only true freedom, is to do the will of God. Real freedom is obedience to the Lord. So this is everything we're doing. You think about all the rules in Orthodoxy. When we're talking about all the, all the stuff we do and the stuff we wear and the way we do our services, all these things exist for the purpose of helping us be truly free, which is counterintuitive, right? But this is why, this is why Father Alexander Schmemann right here would say, and it, it ticks me off sometimes because I disagree with him, but I agree with him. He says, Christ, Christianity is the end of religion. You know, because the point is, this is not about just fulfilling these laws. We don't make God happy. We don't, we don't, we don't make Jesus happy love us more by doing by keeping his commandments no rather we establish faith in him and we're able in doing these things to find freedom by his grace as he works we work we work at our salvation in him with him and through him so our challenge then as persons is to be truly free and that that requires well I'll read it here prayer fasting almsgiving supporting uh, the efforts of the church um, with our finances with our time all the things that would constitute ascetic living, uh, pilgrimages, um, you know, uh, giving, giving. Um, I think about last year we had a, 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 we gave a lot of money to Syria, the refugees, things like that. These are ways that, that we connect our life to other people, and we cultivate our freedom in doing that. So, and we get to choose it. We get to. We have to choose it, right? It isn't. If someone says you have to do this, it doesn't count. Yeah. You know. So. And this is the advantage, by this is why I'm very glad to be American Orthodox, because I get to choose this. And I love the other churches, I love the Russian church. And, and in, indeed, you can be a bad Christian or non-Christian in Russia, but you know, there's a lot of support for being Orthodox. Here, we have to choose it. And I don't think that's a bad thing. <clears throat> okay, person as relational. Slide nine. The patriarch says this, freedom is not only personal, but it is interpersonal. Jesus teaches in the Gospels, we only love God in as much as we love our brothers and sisters. Remember um, in the Good Samaritan narrative, 
Um, he's, he's asked by uh, this lawyer, who is my neighbor? And the answer to that question is the whole parable, right? He, he tells the, the story of, of, of the Jewish guy who was beat up on the road and robbed. And then the, this Samaritan, this farmer, finds him and takes care of him and, and takes him to the end and pays for his care. Well, Jesus says, well, who is my neighbor? Well, it's these guys, these two foreigners who shouldn't like each other. That's my neighbor. Um, and the test of love in God is, do I love my neighbor? This is what the gospel teaches. If we're not considering our neighbor, we're not sent considering the gospel at all. The patriarch continues, as human beings, we cannot be genuinely free in isolation, repudiating our relationship with fellow human beings. We can only be genuinely free if we form part of a community of other free persons, freedom is never solitary, but is always social. Some people say, well, then how far can we have monasticism? Because aren't monks and nuns all about doing their own thing? Only if you don't know anything about monks and nuns. The idea of monasticism and orthodoxy, in fact, is that it is an intense community. It's called cenobitic monasticism. There's something called eremitic or her- hermit monasticism as well. And that's very, very rare. And in fact, it's condemned unless you have a firm formation in community monasticism first. Because hermit life makes you crazy. Because you become autonomous. You become your own beginning and end without God. Well, it can be with God if it's done right. But usually we tend, we tend if we're locked by ourselves and we're not concerned with other people, we, we start to fall into our own world. And so the whole point of family life the whole point of monastic life is the same. It is to butt heads with someone else, to lose, to die to your own will, to have to relate to other people, to, to, ha- to have your will denied. You know, when your baby poops, you have to change her diaper. It's a pain in the butt, but you have to change it. And that's part of your salvation. We believe that's part of our growth in God. Similarly, in a monastic setting, you have brothers or you have sisters if you're a nun. And it's hard, and you're always having to navigate your own will and what sister so-and-so needs, what brother so-and-so needs, and obeying the abbot, obeying the abbess is part of the tradition, not not in parishes, but in monasteries, the, the tradition of obedience. In the parishes, you obey God. <laughs> you obey, and if you're married, you listen to your spouse. You know, that's our, we practice obedience that way. In a monastery, you practice obedience to God's commandments, but also to your abbot or your abbess. It's a little different. But the point is, you butt heads... And you, you work through these relationships. And even the holiest, uh, there's a, a wonderful saint, I wish I'd put a picture of him here, called St. John Maximovich. He's a 20th century Russian bishop. And I don't know if you know this, but in Orthodox liturgy, we're not allowed, the priest cannot serve a liturgy by himself. Uh, in the Catholic Church, it's a very popular piety to have private masses. You can't do that in Orthodoxy. Because we, the idea is, when we offer liturgy, it's a communal activity. It's a communal action. We do it together. We're two or three gathered together. There am I. Um, anyway, this, this bishop would serve daily liturgy, which is a wonderful practice. And most of the days, you'd have people there, but some days, there'd be no one there. And a brother bishop found out about it and said, Vladika, which means master bishop, I heard that you have liturgies with no one there. And, and St. John turned to him and said, but oh, Bishop, whatever his name was, I'm surrounded by all the angels and all the apostles and we're singing hymns to God with all of heaven. So here's a man by himself in a room by himself, but even in his own consciousness, he's relational. Relating to God, relating to the saints, relating to all the angels, joining chorus with all those who are worshiping God. So my, my, my favorite mentor at seminary uh, I had a lot of favorite ones. He's one of my, Father Paul Laser taught me how to serve, uh, serve as a priest at St. Vladimir's. And um, one day he was serving liturgy and was overcome with emotion, which is not like him. He's very, he was not an emotional kind of guy. Not really. And I asked him afterwards, I said, Father, what, what happened? Why were you crying? He said, he said, well, I was here and all of a sudden I could see my, my parents around the altar and all my friends who died and I could see the angels and it was just so wonderful. I didn't want it to stop. You know? So here we are in the liturgy. It's relational, right? So I, I'm hoping I'm giving you a framework here. That's the idea. Um, continuing this thought, persons are relational. 
because God is relational. So um, anyone know what this, this uh, image is? Rublov's Trinity, but what does it actually depict? Hospitality of Abraham. Hospitality of Abraham. This is slide uh, 10. Um, you remember the Old Testament, Genesis? Uh, Abraham is, uh, he was really neat. He would, he, would, he would wait in hospitality for people. He would, he would be waiting to help somebody. And all of a sudden, these three angels arrive. Oh, he doesn't know they're angels, but there are three men. And they arrive, and he, he, he kills the fatted calf. He does all the things that a Middle Eastern gentleman might do. And they eat together. And, um, and later on, uh, you know, they tell him he's going to have a son. And remember, Sarah laughs and everything. And, but he has a son. Anyway, um, the church fathers always saw this triad as a foreshadowing of the Holy Trinity. Not as the Trinity itself, but as an image, a kind of prophecy, so to speak. And in fact, some of the fathers thought that the, that the middle one w- was Christ himself, pre-incarnate. It, that's not like dogma. That's sort of like what some fathers think. Who knows? But in this particular image, uh, it's the three angels that come to Abraham. But we, we, we are invited to think of them as an image of, of Father, Son, and Spirit. Who might this one be? In the middle. It's Christ. If you look at, at the way he's vested, uh, well, you... you you can't see it, but uh, if you look at the icons in the church, he, he always has the same garment. So he, this was the image of Christ. This one over here is, is, is blessing in the manner of a bishop off to the side, like the Father. And then this over here is sort of showing forth the green of life and la- laying forth the hand, almost invi- and then inviting us to the table. What we see in this icon is this beautiful action of the three in mutual love and relationship inviting us to come and sup with them. And that's our vision of who God is. God is relational. And God, when calling us into being, he, he, we're, we, we are in His image, which is relational, right? We're designed to relate to other people. And we need other people to be saved, we believe. It's just part of our communal vision of, of how God is. So, we celebrate this. God is Trinity. God is love. By the way, when, when someone, you meet a Unitarian or a they're not dogmatic anymore. They used to be. But if you meet a hardcore Unitarian or a, Mo- a Muslim and they tell you God is one, or you even meet some Protestants who have bad theology um, and, and, and they act like God is one, uh, God, God is Unitarian, rather, um, they'll tell you, well, uh, you know, I can't understand three. And I simply like to say, well, how can God be love without an object of love? There has to be an object of love and a subject throughout all time, for God to be... Because He's love, right? We, we believe that as Christians. God is love. And the only way He can be love is if, if, if there's relational dimensions in God Himself. Father, Son, and Spirit, we would say. So, um, one of my favorite quotes um, from Dostoevsky is Staditz Zosima, who says this, We are each responsible for everyone and for everything. We're all connected. Our sins reverberate. Our, our grace reverberates. Our, our every good decision we make reverberates. Every fall we make reverberates to those around us. Saint Silvano Manathos, a 20th century saint, said, "My brother is my life." That was his motto. My brother is my life. Um, his salvation was tied to his brothers. An old Russian proverb says this: "The only thing we can do alone is go to hell." So the path to hell is is a solitary path, or we can be with others and work out our salvation with them, learn to love, learn to care, learn to um, endure. And in doing that, we have a chance of of knowing God better. So persons are relational. A fourth and final kind of aspect tonight is person as icon of wholeness. Slide 11. You remember in, in Great Lent, we pray this incredible prayer. I'll say it for you. Um, it's O Lord it's written in the 5th century by St. Ephraim of Syria it goes like this O Lord and Master of my life take from me the spirit of sloth despair lust of power and idle talk but give rather the spirit of chastity humility patience and love to thy servant yea O Lord and King grant me to see my own transgressions and not to judge my brother for blessed art thou unto the ages of ages Amen 
And a really important word in what God gives to us, uh, give rather the Spirit, is the word chastity. I, f- I forget what it is. I think it's sophrosinus in Greek. Sophrosini. Uh, in, in, in Russian, it's selimudria. And it, it refers to not just sexual chastity, but, but to complete wholeness. Complete wholeness of personality. Being integrated. Right? And, and we, we know our American disease now, we have compartments. Right? I've, got, I've got this part of my, my work life. I've got my, secu- I've got my secular life. I go to church on Sunday over here. I do a Bible study over here. I go to the, the nudie bar with my, bo- my friends over here. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, what people, that's what people do it, you know? They think this way. People think this way. We, have our, we, have our, we, have our, we go to the monastery one weekend, and then we go do something awful the next weekend. And, um, this, is a, this is a real breakdown in integrity, in, in celemudria, in chastity. And I'm not just talking about sexual. I mean, even the way we conceive, you know, uh, politics. And I'm not arguing for anything politically, by the way. End of story. Um, <laughs> But for, for the Orthodox, uh, wholeness is one of the, the goals of our personal journey. So this, this encompasses three things. Internal integrity, right? Kind of being true to who we are inside. Um, we ha- having integrity with other people. And then having a cosmic integrity. Being, being, being at peace, so to speak, with all of creation. This is why uh, um, Patriot Bartholomew... I think he's right. Uh, he speaks about the environment a lot, the importance of taking care of being good. His key word is stewardship. We're stewards of what God has created and given us. And, and ultimately, we're stewards of our children. We're stewards of our communities. We're stewards of the building God has given us. Um, I, I'm steward of my own life. You're steward of your life, your, you know, our families. All these things, we, we are, and, and as, unto whom much is given, much is acquired. So, um, Part of our, our wholeness is pursuing wholeness in all these areas, personally, with others, and with creation. Wholeness implies, you might say, health, physically, emotionally, spiritually. The patriarch says this, The human race was set at the center of creation by God, not so as to exercise a selfish and arbitrary domination over nature, but so as to refashion and transfigure the created order, to give it a voice so to render it back to God in priestly oblation. So, to be whole is to exercise a priesthood that all Christians are called to have too, which is to... And I got in a conversation this week with somebody about the importance of... They asked me, they said, Father Justin, I don't understand this idea that we could have... We, could have, we can have the Virgin Mary or the saints as mediators. I said, well, let, let me tell you something. According to our church tradition, we have one unique mediator. Who is that? Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. One unique mediator. We also have many mediators. All who are his, he's the high priest. Those who are baptized into Christ are his priests. What do priests do? They mediate. They offer intercession for others. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of Christ calling us his priests. He's the high priest, we're the priests. And thirdly, we also have in our communities, we have pastors who perform priestly role connecting the, the, the priests within the community to each other and to the high priest. A, a sort of a functional priesthood within the community. But we have, there are two really important truths. There's one priest, and we're all priests if we're, if we're Christians operating in, in Christ. So uh, when, when we talk about the saints, or we talk about even each other, we're all called to mediate the grace of God to one another all the time, every day, you know, you mediate Christ to your friends at school, hopefully. I mediate him to you. You mediate him to me when I'm having a bad day or a good day. We all mediate Christ to each other, and that's the very meaning of Christian, right? A little Christ, you mediate. So um, I don't know where we get off on the idea that mediators are bad. We affirm there's one mediator, but, but we're, not, we're not priests unless we're all being mediating the grace of God. So... The human race is there to offer, give voice to creation, give voice to other people, to render it all back to God in priestly service. Another feature of the lack of wholeness in our time is, uh, well, I kind of alluded to it, is radical secularism. 
where people choose to not see the world as gift and revelation of God, where people abandon their priesthood uh, um, and instead just compartmentalize their lives. So uh, we would we would definitely argue against a kind of um, hardened secularism as Orthodox Christians. So, so the dignity and high calling of the person are revealed in the Trinity, right? We see the person, the persons at work here. We see how we're invited into the, into the life of God Himself. Uh, we see also the work, of the high calling, high calling of the pre, of the person revealed in the person of Jesus, right? We see it in His His preaching. You think about the Good Samaritan. You think about the parables. I am the Good Shepherd. We see him as the Good Shepherd who who seeks the lost sheep, who who who, who rejoices over the one that's found, you know, uh, who who uh, who know the sheep by name and the sheep know his voice. We see we see this interpersonal dynamic in in everything Jesus does, and most especially that we see it in the cross, because the cross reveals. The truth that God would not remain far from us, would draw near to us. So much so that even his judgment is his pouring out of his own life for us. His his own judgment would be his own self-offering. And he says there's no greater love than this, than a a man lay down his life for his friend. And so, um, and the church fathers, I mean, we have all these feasts of the cross. I could preach about the cross for like, I don't know how long, a long time. But I, I will keep moving here because I, I want to keep things brief and concise each night. So uh, we see we see the high calling of the person in the Trinity in in Christ. The cross is a sign of self offering. It's free self offering. He does it freely. He does it in solidarity in love for mankind. The cross is a sign that man can be remade. That man can become what he's truly supposed to be. Uh, I was sharing with the college kids last week that it's no accident that that the Crucifixion takes place on Friday, which is the which is the sixth day of the week, which is the day that Adam and Eve were made, and the only uh, the only at the end of every day, God said, and it was good, and so it was, and it was good. The only day that doesn't have that is the sixth day, and it's like a dot dot dot, and then you hear Christ say, "It is finished." He finishes the work of creation of man. Man is not completed until the cross. And and what and when, when Adam when Adam is made, what happens? He falls asleep, and from his side comes what? The rib comes out, and what comes out? Eve comes out. Eve comes out from Adam. What comes out from Christ's side on the cross on Holy Friday? Blood and water, which come, which mean what for the Orthodox? For the early church fathers, forget the Orthodox. It's what the early church taught. It's the Eucharist. Baptism and Eucharist. The, 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 the very sacraments that sustain the church, right? That constitute the church. Baptism, Eucharist, the two chief sacraments. From the side of Christ comes his bride, the church. So mankind is remade by this free act of love of Jesus Christ. And from his side comes his bride, the, the new Eve, the church. We also see the dignity of the persons, which, which expresses Trinity and Christ. We see it in the sacraments of the church. And we're going to spend a, a basically a whole class later on on the sacraments, more or less. But it's worth mentioning them right now. We see it in baptism, which symbolizes our death into Christ. And in fact, we believe in baptism. We, we meet Christ in power, in holy baptism. That's a very odd, by the way, it's a very odd way of doing baptism. I'm pouring. You know why I'm pouring? How do we normally baptize in Orthodoxy? Immersion, Immersion right? Um, 90, 98% of the time. Um, he was a two and a half, three year old, and it would have freaked him out. And so the church canons allow a pouring if, if, if a immersion is not practical. That's from the first century it says that, by the way. So baptism and anointing with the oil, uh, chrismation, these are part of the sacraments of entry. In that, uh, the chrismation is like the anointing of a king. We're made his, we're made his priests and kings. Um, in the Holy Eucharist, right from his body, from his side comes the blood, uh, the very blood and body and blood of Christ. We believe it's the real presence, of course. 
Um, the sacrament of confession. This is actually um, a picture from the old church, as you can tell. And um, when someone converts to our faith, they will give a life confession. And so uh, I heard his confession the day before. I didn't do the absolution until the day he was received into our church. And I, that, that's the prayer of absolution. You typically will see me do that sometimes before liturgy over in that corner or after Vespers on Saturday night. But we see in that sacrament the mercy of Jesus being poured out. Um, it's, it's such an incredible moment. Um, we have as well uh, other sacraments I didn't have pictures of. Holy Unction, uh, Sacrament of the Sick, where we gather around and pray for the, for the ill. We have the Sacrament of Monastic Tonsure, which is a, an incredibly beautiful... I might show a video of that from Russia. It's so amazingly profound. The Sacrament of Ordination, where, where, where the church sets aside certain people for service. And we have the sacraments as well of Christian marriage. You see the crowns that are placed on the, on the bridegroom's head and the cup that they drink from, uh, reminding us of the union with Christ. And of course, Christian burial. This was just a week ago, uh, burying one of our own youth kids, um, just 10 days ago. So um, commending him to the earth and doing that in a very earthy way. Right? I mean, how many, how many churches will have kids bury their dead. So, uh, anyway, all of these things reveal to us the importance of interpersonal, these are, these are all personal things. They're very, you know, we're, in, we're interacting, we're practice. A priest once, how many of you have heard of Father Stephen Freeman? He's a really good blogger. I was his assistant priest for a couple years. And uh, one of my favorite things he would say, he said, you know, in the liturgy, the priest says, grant, O Lord, that we may more perfectly partake of the never-ending day of thy kingdom. He says, when we do the liturgy, we have to realize that we're like kids imaging the kingdom. It's almost like kids in kindergarten playing house. It's more than, it's real. Yeah. But, but we have to understand that what we're doing is we're practicing for the day without end. We're practicing what it looks like to worship and to love and to relate. And so, you know, we're building this framework in this life so that we're ready for it uh, in, in the day without end. So this is our challenge, and I hope that this framework is helpful to you as we start looking at what our church teaches more concretely. Next week uh, will be... Oh, oh, I would add, too, of course, we, we relate in prayer, too. Of course, relate to, to Christ, and in, in the service, we relate to others, right? When we do our common worship together, it is something we do with other people. And like I said, you can't have liturgy by yourself. You have to have other people there. So our prayer, communally and personally, is still relational with God and with others. So um, next week we'll turn to Orthodox uh, worldview formation in Christ, and then um, asking the questions specifically: How does an Orthodox worldview contrast with a pagan one? Very important. Why are we Christians? Why aren't we pagans? And then how does an Orthodox worldview contrast with perhaps some other Christian worldviews? And, and it, the question is. If, how does it contrast? But which ones? And how does it contrast with which ones? Because they're different. There are certain, I mean, obviously, um, Baptists aren't Mormons, right? And Mormons aren't Catholics. And, and they're not at all the same. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that next week. And if you have questions, when I stop recording next week, we can talk about your questions specifically. And with that, I'll hit the stop button, and you can ask questions about tonight's class.